You are listening to the Roberta Glass True Crime Report, putting the true back in true crime. From New York City, Roberta Glass is now on the record. Today's guest is iconoclastic Los Angeles Deputy District Attorney John Lewin. Mr. Lewin grew up in Seattle, Washington, and is a graduate of UC Irvine and UC Hastings College of the Law in San Francisco. John Lewin has been trying cases in Los Angeles since the 1990s and has earned the moniker King of the Cold Cases for the 17 cold cases he's investigated, tried, and won beginning in 2002. It's Lewin's 17 cold case win, Robert Durst, the real estate heir and subject of the wildly popular documentary, The Jink, that rose Lewin to nationwide prominence. Lewin tried Durst, along with Ethan Milius and Habib Billion, for the murder of Susan Berman in a lengthy, broadcasted trial. And it was this trial which showcased his oversized personality and thorough examination of witnesses. His cross-examination of Robert Durst lasted nine days that won Lewin an array of fans and detractors alike. John Lewin has described himself as both undisciplined and obsessive, but I only observed evidence of the latter. Lewin's workday starts early and ends late and stretches through the weekend. D.A. Lewin agreed to a series of interviews while he was out walking his two Great Danes and a Basset Hound through the streets of Los Angeles, in and out of dog parks, and if you're looking for a studio-sounding audio interview, this is not it. However, my conversations with John Lewin were some of my most fascinating and enjoyable and I hope you find them fascinating too. And without ado, here's the first episode in a series of three episodes with the king of the cold cases himself, Deputy DA John Lewin. You've been quoted as calling Durst a psychopath. When did you form that opinion and what made you think that? So I've actually, what I've called him is a narcissistic psychopath, to be plain. So, and listen, we can talk about the definitions of psychopathy. That is more of a colloquial term for what Bob is. What Bob really is, or was, he was the most egocentric, self-centered, self-involved person I've ever met. Never seen anybody like him. And the consequence of that, which is crazy, is that as bright as Bob is, he's really bright, he does not even want to spend energy to cover up his own crimes. So what I mean by that is most people, when they end up committing murder or manslaughter, you know, they get motivated to be on their A game. Their adrenaline goes up, they, you know, what am I going to do? They really want to think through things. This is what's so crazy about Bob. And, and he was very honest about it. When he was asked, because if you think about it, Bob tells Mike Strzok during the first interview that he had drinks with the mayors after he dropped Kathy off. Now, most of us would say, well, how can you tell him that? Because, of course, he's going to check, and as soon as he asks, they're going to say, no, he didn't have drinks with me. Well, you could say, well, maybe he already talked to Bill Mayer, and he thinks Bill Mayer is going to cover for him. No, he never talked to Bill Mayer, never brought it up. So now you have to ask yourself, well, why would he say that? And this is where Bob's honesty, so to speak, kind of rears its appearance. He says, and he said this to Jarecki and Smirling, he says, I wasn't used to people questioning my veracity, asking me what happened. I, it was like a deal. I said what it was, and that was it. It was done. So the guy has had everything his whole life. He hasn't had to explain anything. He doesn't have to hide it. He doesn't have to make up for it. His view is, I said it. He also made the comment, which is, again, total Bob, explaining how he would show up to work at noon wearing nothing but a jock and then laugh at people who were working. And then he would literally tell them, well, 
I don't have to do that because I'm me. So what I mean by narcissistic psychopath is an individual who is so self-involved that their perception of what reality is to the rest of the world seems to go away. So to anybody else, and Bob's very bright, nobody else is going to think, if you tell a detective, you give an alibi, and you say I was with so-and-so, they're going to ask. Even you can take the most uneducated gang member and a common crime. You have a drive, and I'm going back showing my age, driving a car where the steering wheel has been popped and the wires are sticking out, okay? Stolen car. So you stop them. And what the, what the gangster almost always says, where'd you get the car? Oh, I got it from Fred. Does Fred have a last name? No, I don't know his last name. Where does he live? Oh, Fred lives on 26th Street. You have an address? No, I just, he lives up there. Now, Fred doesn't exist. But even the gang member is smart enough to understand that you can't say, I got the car from Fred Williams. He lives at 2316 Main Street. Assuming Fred is a regular guy. Because he knows the cops can check. So the gang member comes up with an absurd story of, I just happened to have a car. And, oh, I didn't notice that the wires were hanging out. And, and I didn't make arrangements when I was going to give it back. And, oh, it turns out it's not registered to Fred. Fred must have stole it, but he didn't tell me. It's an absurd story. But it's not instantly impeachable by giving Fred's name and number to be called. So that's what I mean, that Bob's narcissism ends up distorting the reality that the rest of us live with. That's what I mean by that. I got a feeling watching the trial that there was a kind of tension between not wanting to face the consequences for what he had done, killing his wife and killing Susan Berman, and also being incredibly proud of it because these murders seem to be the only things he accomplished in his life. Well, so, so I don't think that Bob was proud of the murders at all. Hmm. And I will tell you, having interviewed him, Bob feels very bad about Susan. He doesn't feel bad about Morris at all. And Kathy is much less clear. But I can tell you, Bob feels terrible about Susan. I knew that the first day I interviewed her. How could you and, tell? Well, because Bob doesn't like to talk about it. When I would talk about Morris, he was very derogatory. When I would talk about Kathy, it was still somewhat derogatory. When I would talk about Susan, you could see it in his face. Susan was a great friend of him. She was very loyal. And the other reason you know it is what's the one crime that he confessed to intentionally? It's Susan. And he did it to Nick Chabin. And why did he confess to Nick? Because in my opinion, he wanted Nick to understand that he didn't do it because he wanted to. He had no I mean, choice. he was honest. In this, right. in, he yeah. had no choice. And by, and by the way, I, I've heard so many people say, you know, Susan wasn't going to say anything. Well, if you know Susan, and Steve Silverman said this, and Bob said this, whether Susan intended not to say anything, Susan had a big mouth. She's not someone you wanted to tell your secrets to. So there's a difference between being loyal, which she was, and being able to hold out and not spill your guts on what you know, uh, my belief is, had Susan been contacted by police and had it been an effective interview, what happened with Kathy, she would have she would have had to have admitted to. Now, the problem for Bob, and we all know this, is you can talk about the morality of what Bob did with Susan, right? I mean, obviously, it's murder. It's execution, cold-blooded murder. It's horrendous. You can argue with the morality. You can't argue with the logic. Susan absolutely needed to go for Bob from his perspective. The problem for him is, is that he waited 20 years too long. Did not realize that she told this story to so many people. Mm. And boy, did she, boy, did you have a lot of uh, witnesses that she told. We did, did you find Susan Berman's personality? I, I found her not, not very likable for a victim. Did well, you find that a challenge? I, I know that you, you said things like um, in the closing, you said we're all flawed. Uh, Su Susan uh, Berman was a flawed person. Was that a, was that a challenge for you? N not at all. I, I learned a long time ago, and I've seen too many prosecutors make the mistake of, in essence, when someone gets murdered, right, or they die, that doesn't deify them. 
you know what I mean? You don't get killed. So years ago, part of this might be I paid for a big chunk of my education by being a hemodialysis technician. I started when I was 18 and I worked you know, for 11 years right until I got hired by the DA's office, you know, through law school, through college, et cetera. And as a dialysis technician, I took care of end stage renal patients. And these patients, you saw them, I didn't work full time during the, you know, while I was in school, but I did more than full time before, after, and on vacations. You would see these people constantly. And it's a very end stage renal disease. Many of them are end stage diabetics. They have glomerular nephritis, they have uh, uremia, and they are in very poor shape. And so their quality of life sometimes is not, is not great. And like everybody, there are patients who, before they got dialysis, they were not nice people. And now they're getting dialysis, and they're still not nice people. And I worked at a hospital, one of them, when I was in college, a Catholic hospital that had a bunch of nuns who were wonderful women, nurses. And I remember one of the nurses, we lost a patient who was just not a nice person. And this nurse says to me, oh, my God. I miss so-and-so. And I said, wait, are you kidding? So-and-so was terrible. They treated us horribly. You, you couldn't stand dealing with that person. That's a lesson that I've taken to my work as a prosecutor. I never try to make anybody into something that they're not. Susan was very flawed. Now, let's go a little more into that. Susan also had some wonderful qualities. She was incredibly loyal. She was very bright. She was very generous. She would do anything to help those close to her. But yeah, she had her flaws. Now, I have never thought that Susan was overtly blackmailing Bob. Never thought so. And if you were to ask Susan, hey, am I trying to extort money from Bob? Susan would have said, no, of course not. But Susan knew what she had over Bob, and she was able to subtly remind him he knew and that's why he's sending her this money now bob didn't kill susan because of the money he would have continued to send her that money no problem what got susan killed was the conversation where she said to him uh the police want to talk to me and i'm going to talk to them she signed her death warrant when she said that because bob understood like i do like steve silverman understood that Susan is going to end up giving away what she knows. So, no, it was not a, it was not a challenge having a victim who was flawed. So, Almost everyone is. I was going to ask you about Durst's age and his frailty yes. and if that was a challenge. Uh, to be seen as someone, you're larger than life in the courtroom. You're very powerful. Were you afraid of being seen as bullying Durst? That's an interesting, that's an interesting perspective. So first of all, we structured the case specifically so that we would start with who Bob was. That was important, not so jurors hated him, but so they understood why he did what he did. Now, the consequence of that was that the more you see a Bob, the less you like him. And people need to distinguish something because it's come even, even with, um, with two of the jurors that I've spoken to at length. One of whom has been, um, I can identify because she's spoken, Carmen, who was the foreman. Carmen has said that, you know, there was something likable about Bob, charismatic about Bob. But I don't actually think she means likable. What she actually means is Bob is interesting. He's fascinating. He's like a plane crash that you can't take your eyes off. He is he is just fascinating, the stuff that he does, the things that he says. I think that because Bob has a great sense of humor, because he can be entertaining, and because you can literally laugh, not just at him, but sometimes with him, that people who don't know are like, oh, juries really loves him. No, they don't. The jury knows exactly who he is. Just because they were entertained by things that he did, just because they found his sense of humor funny at times, just because they found him to be interesting, doesn't mean for a second they believed any of his bullshit or that they didn't understand that beneath all that is a truly 
horrible individual. And what do I mean by that? Well, you can be a decent person, Roberta, and you can kill someone close to you. If you think about it in your life, if I were to ask you right now, I want you to tell me the three most angry times you've been in your life. I will wager you money, at least two of those three, probably all three of them, involve people that you cared very much about. You don't have to tell me, but just answer that question. Think about it right now and you tell me. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And the reason is because in order to get that angry, there generally needs to be some kind of relationship that triggers that level. So you can get into a horrible fight with your husband or with your wife and you can snap and you can do something that is horrible that you can't undo. And it doesn't make you an evil person. And I'm going to contrast that with you decide you're going to go rape and murder the old lady next door. Okay. You're a horrible human being. Does that make sense? Yes. So I always believed that just because you're a murder defendant doesn't mean you're a horrible person. Now, Bob was a horrible person, not necessarily because of the, the night that he killed Kathy. I don't know what happened that night. But if you look at the history of domestic violence, what he would do to her, what he said to her, if you look at even in court, mm -hmm. he tried to murder her reputation a second time. One of the things I've just still boggling to me, absolutely astonishing, is that Bob went out of his way and the defense went out of their way to argue that Kathy didn't deserve to get into medical school. Do you remember any of that testimony? I, I and do. And then, they, and then they tried to paint her as an addict who was going to the same yeah. rehab as yeah, the... Yeah. Medical school, she was a right. Well, medic, well, well but the, I, the, med, the medical, the hospital where the she master. wanted to work at, right? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, the residency. But, but I'm going to go step by step on this because the idea that it would be your strategy to try and diminish Kathy's accomplishments, you have to ask yourself let's assume it's true. Does that in any way help you with your case? So let's assume that Kathy only got into medical school because of his family connections. Do you think, Roberta, that in any way is going to diminish the fact that Bob Durst killed her? Is that an excuse? Is that a mitigation in any way? No. So what was mind-boggling to me is why they would bring that up, because even if true, it doesn't help them. Let me explain why. We had our jury, as an example, and it's the worst, you know, I can say it now, Bob's dead and there's no appeal. Basic malpractice, having a jury consultant and lawyers choose to keep a medical doctor who went through medical school when they were about Kathy's age, who is a pathologist, who understands all of the cause of death issues, who volunteered at the uh, coroner's office in, in Albuquerque, who will instantly understand that it's complete bullshit that Bob would have ever, I'm sorry, that Kathy would have ever called the medical school dean and not her rotation. How do you keep that person on the jury? I mean, you should be trying to use two, two challenges just to make sure you get her, that you get her off. Right. We're going to get a little bit of wind, we'll get a little wind for a minute. So hold on. Okay. Yet they wanted her on the jury. Now, here's the other problem. Not only does she know the absurdity of, of your main defenses in the case, but how do you think she's going to respond, even if it's true, which it isn't, when you try to diminish Kathy's accomplishments? So there was a yeah, complete lie. Not, that's not going to go over well, yeah. She was deeply offended. At times, she wanted to cry, I found out later, because you can only separate yourself so much, and... Carmen and Kathy also had something else in common. They both grew up poor. They both worked their asses off to get to where they got. So I knew, and this is why we put on all the evidence from the start of who Bob Durst was. 
That was so important. Who is Bob Durst? So the next thing that we did, because I knew this would be important, is we had to explain who Kathy was, how their relationship developed. And we knew that as the jury heard all these clips, all this evidence, there was going to be no sympathy for Bob. We also knew that Bob did not look the way he did at trial. Plus, I saved in my pocket, which they forgot about. They didn't even know until we played it. In Texas, Bob had written a letter trying to fake some kind of eye problem so he would not have to participate in prison work stuff. I had him on tape with Stuart Altman, where Bob was literally saying, Stuart calls him right after he's arrested in New Orleans, his arraignment, and Bob has a shaved head. And Stuart says, in essence, ah, I know what you were doing. You shaved your head to show your shunt for the jury. And Bob's like, I can't get anything past you, Stuart. That was great. So, yeah. And I knew that I had a conversation on the phone with Bob and Susie where he was asking her, she was looking up how to fake dementia. So I knew, and I think I've said this before. I don't know if if I have, if I told you this or not. I look for the best situation that you can have with a jury is where a jury listens to something that a defendant says, okay? At the time they say it, they actually believe it, part of it, some of it, et cetera. And you know that when they are believing whatever that is, it's bad for your case. But you also know that what he is saying is not just a complete lie. You have evidence that you're gonna put on in two days, in four days, in 20 minutes, that's going to completely impeach the defendant and i've learned over 30 years doing this that what jurors hate more than a defendant lying to them they hate that they hate when a defendant lies to them any witness and they believed it because now they don't just feel lied to they feel stupid so i knew that anything bob was saying any sympathy anything that he was going to do in the end we would be able to blow him up you know, in spectacular fashion that the jurors would be angry if any of them had fallen for it. I also knew that he was doing everything he could to try and curry sympathy with the jury. The bag, you know, in Galveston, they have a little sweater. They lowered his chair. He was literally flashing, which the jurors noticed. He, he, he took his catheter bag out and was like waving it at them. So, yeah, I was not worried about them feeling sorry for him at all. The TV people, apparently they did, but they weren't in the courtroom. There were comments like that in the chat that you were a bully, that you were that you were an egotist, that you were going on too long. And then the, it was about split. And then there was about the other people in the chat <laughs> saying, pearls before swine. This is a freaking fantastic cross. You guys don't know what the heck you're talking about. So it, it, was, it, it, was, it, it was interesting to see, but... So speaking of catheter, there's two things I want to uh, address. One thing is that you changed Durst's catheter bag. Was that in front of the jury? No, No? that didn't happen. No, I didn't change it. Here's what here's what happened. I want to back up. There was a lot of discussion of you know Lewin's going to kill this old man. He doesn't know. He doesn't care. He's extremely sick. I've got more of a medical background than any of the other lawyers that are in that room or the judge because of what I did for 11 years. My wife's a surgeon, my father's a nephrologist. So my position was never that Bob wasn't sick. Bob's definitely sick. I knew that Bob was sick. The issue though, was that the defense was trying to make it seem as if he was about to die when there was no evidence to support it. And worse, that if they mistried the case that somehow later he would be better, which made no sense. So the catheter bag, I noticed when Bob ended up having, went in the hospital because he had one of his issues and the catheter bag was full and I had let the court and the defense lawyers know about it and defense lawyers didn't do anything. And I was concerned that potentially what was going to happen was at a certain point, I said to the defense and to the bailiff, hey, listen, this bag is, is full. It's potentially going to back up. It, you also have weight. It's very, un- it's potentially uncomfortable. It needs to be just drained. So I say, tell the defense attorneys that. Literally, their response was, we're not doing anything. 
I said, well, it's got to get changed. They said, uh, I said, well, I said, I'll do it. Well, go ahead. So I go back in the back at lunch, not in front of the jury, with the bailiff. Bob was back there. He had a shock look on his face because I don't go back there. And I say to him, listen, I'm just here to change your bag. I'm not here to talk to you, obviously. Your bag needs to be changed. If you want me to drain it, I will. If you don't, I won't. He says, go ahead. And I just I put on had a pair of gloves on and I just open up the valve and he just he just squirts into the toilet like you're peeing. So I went back out. I wanted to make sure I put on the record what happened, not in front of the jury. And the Garrett never seems to have a concept of what he should and shouldn't say. He makes the following comment. I hope you washed your hands. I mean, here, here his, the prosecutor's having, he's getting paid $10 million, $12 million, and the prosecutor has to take care of his client. I would have thought he would have been embarrassed and ashamed, but apparently not. So that was the history there. And then Bob later says to one of his lawyers that something in effect of because I changed his bag and was nice, it's going to be hard on him to destroy me on cross. <laughs> so, uh, well, that didn't happen, but <laughs> good confidence there, Durst. <laughs> well, listen, well, so in going back to Bob's issue, it's not that Bob was proud of what he did. Bob loves attention. Bob's biggest fear is irrelevance. That's his biggest fear. Well, it's his second biggest fear. He doesn't like personal discomfort, but he also does not like irrelevance. So Bob, that's why Bob always wanted to see how many cameras were there. And he wanted Stuart and Emily and Sue Giordano and Gene Clark to send in and Emily to send in all of his um, clippings. Bob loves the attention. The worst thing for him is just irrelevance, disinterest. One more thing about the medical issues in this trial. You got quite emotional and you about the way that they were disparaging Kathy McCormick or Kathy McCormick Durst's memory. Yeah. And, yeah, I didn't like it. And you said to the judge, look, I, I went through this with my wife. This really upsets me, the, the way that they're trashing her. Do you believe that that was Bob's direction to his legal team? Was his legal team just so... No kind of no, his, callous his, that no, they didn't no. they didn't care or what kind of advantage do you think that they were going to get from that you have to ask them i'm not going to sit here and lie if i told you i was impressed by the lawyering on the other side outside of chip lewis i'd be a straight liar so why they took that tactic you have to ask them it was absolutely ineffective it didn't help at all this is where i don't think they understood even if what Bob is saying is true. You don't need to run Kathy down to do it. And if you're going to run her down, if you want to make her a drug addict, well, you know, listen, if they could make her a drug addict, that would be helpful, right? Now, you'd still have the problem of what happened to her body, obviously, right? But if you could make her a drug addict, that would be relevant. Does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. If you could do it, it would be relevant. That maybe she but just you have, went off and OD'd but, somewhere right, or something. Right. right went but off with now the problem, right. Now the occurs. problem is going to be, yeah, where's her body, et cetera. But here's the problem. You have to know what the evidence is that's out there. Mm -hmm. They didn't know the medical records. One of the problems in this case is we knew the discovery in this case backwards and forwards. The person on my team, whoever they might be, that knew the case the least, knew it 10 times better than any of the lawyers on the other side. And some of us on the team knew it a hundred or a thousand times better. So the problem with the idea of trying to make Kathy into a drug addict is you can't do it when she's in the middle of rotations. It doesn't work. Right. If that could have worked, that would have made sense. It was never going to work and they should have known that. But the idea of demeaning her like getting into medical school, even if that works, what does it accomplish you? Nothing. So it's very kind of defense attorney 101 to try and run down your victim. Again, I have much more experience than any, any of those lawyers do in dealing with cases where, you know, my area of expertise are, you know, regular, your, your neighbor woman disappears. She's not a gang member. She's not a drug dealer. Uh, she doesn't have a high risk lifestyle. And so 
in those situations, it doesn't work to try and put the victim on trial. But because that's what defense attorneys are used to doing, that's the trick most of them have. That's what they try to do in Galveston with Morris Black. Now, the problem with that was is that in the end, Morris Black was just a cantankerous old guy. They tried to make him into some kind of, you know, menacing, uh, you know, homicidal maniac. It was absurd and pathetic. That demonstration was just oh, well, 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 sad I, you know, I don't know if you and picked, silly. I don't know if you picked, I, I you picked it up, but are you aware of how, of how that happened? If you listen, they didn't plan that out. Bob wasn't allowed to get up. They were going to have Bob, I guess, try to do it. Now, normally what you would do is you would check with the bailiff in advance to find out, hey, what are you going to let Bob do, right? That's what lawyers do. You check to see, hey, I want to do this. You ought to talk to the bailiff and the judge. So in the middle of their thing, the bailiff says, basically, Bob can't stand up. So I suggest to them, you can hear this. Hey, why don't you guys do it? Dave can be, I mean. Why don't you have him try on the glove? Great idea. I mean, I'm I'm not thinking they're actually going to do it. And then, of course, Chesnoff is loving it. You know, he's like an actor or something. And I don't think they realized they made a joke of their own defense. Their own defense was a punchline joke. And it was funny. Even all the defense apologists on these shows were like, yeah, that didn't go well. So it was always it was always these are some of the best lawyers in America talking about <laughs> Yes, not the defense. <laughs> you know, yeah. These are the best lawyers in America, so I know, you know, they've got their plan of what's going to happen. On that one, they're even like, yeah, I don't think I would have done that. So the demonstration was just mind-boggling, and the idea that we, we were able to suggest it. And by the way, a, a little minor part of it, and Ethan went, <laughs> Ethan went into this on closing. Yeah, yeah the, the, well, you can hear it. It's not a secret. You can, if you listen to the video, you'll hear me say, hey, why don't you guys, hey, why don't you be? So the other part of it, and Ethan hammered this home in closing, is their demonstration did not help them. Yeah. It was, was physically impossible. They did not, but no, meaning they did not know the positioning. They didn't know the ballistics. They didn't know the blood pattern evidence. So what they said happened doesn't work. Ethan got them to stipulate that where Bob is falling, Morris is falling, is nowhere near the wall, and they don't know. My question about getting so so emotional in court, I think that's why so many true crime people love you, is because you are passionate, you're prepared like no lawyer has ever been prepared. But thinking about that Aristotle quote, the law is reason free from passion, so- so do you find that to be true? And do you find your feelings and your outrage and the things that upset you, does that help? Does that fuel you? Do you find it helpful? What I am is very genuine. The person you see outside the courtroom is the same person you see inside the courtroom. The only difference is my level of profanity outside the courtroom. <laughs> and every once in a while, I'll slip up. But so none of my stuff in court is insincere or practiced. It's how I feel. Now, I will tell you that just because you might think that I'm out of control, very rarely is that going to be the case. So no, I, I will I didn't say out of control. I just said I said well, no, 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 yeah. no, 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 but, but people will think, oh, you know, Lewin's lost here. I haven't lost anything. I know what I'm doing. I'm doing it for it's, it's genuine, it's sincere, but it's also tactical. There are very few things in the courtroom. You can disagree with my tactics. You can disagree with my strategy, but I always have a tactic and a strategy. I am not simply going out there. Most things I do, most things I say, most jokes I make, they're for a reason. Last thing about Durst. Sure. Judge Chris believes that the way Morris Black was cut up she believes that Durst killed many more people than three people. She speculates. Do you believe that is a good theory? The word, the word serial killer is normally used to describe people who kill for the act of killing. So in other words, their target offense is the murder itself. Ted Bundy, right. Jeffrey Dahmer, you know, the Night Stalker, etc. They don't kill because... 
something happens, their target offense is to murder. That's not Bob Durst in these crimes. But Bob Durst didn't kill because he enjoys killing or likes killing. Bob Durst killed for very understandable reasons. Now, let's assume that Bob Durst is responsible for kidnapping and murdering three young girls. That would mean that is a completely different kind of a murder than the killings that we tried him for and that we allege in our case. Would you agree? Yes. So is it possible that Bob Durst could be a guy who killed his wife during an argument, killed Susan to cover it up, killed Morris to cover it up, and then also that same guy is also a sociopathic killer who seeks out young girls to murder them? That is certainly possible. Do I think it's reasonable? Absolutely not. Do I think there's any evidence of it? Absolutely not. That is why I did not put that evidence in. Just because evidence is, is potentially helpful for me doesn't mean I'm going to use it. perfect example would be the story by uh, President's, the first lady's ex-husband, who came up with this story of, you know, some romantic night with Kathy where, you know, Bob came over and threw money at him. The story was preposterous. He called Kathy Kathleen, which no one ever calls her. He never reported at the time. He said that, well, I reported it, but it was to a different precinct, never came forward. And the person that brought this up was the lawyer who was uh, suing uh, everybody and their uncle uh, on the case. And I would never use that evidence, even if I thought it was helpful, because I don't believe it. I don't find it credible. The same goes for I never, in this case, once tried to bring up anything about those missing girls. The only time I brought it up was at a time DeGaron was arguing that I was bringing in the Galveston evidence to try to muddy up his client, meaning I'm not bringing it in for a legitimate reason. I'm bringing it up just to make Bob look bad. Now, that would be, A, completely unethical, because I can't do that as a prosecutor, and B, it's 100% untrue. So in making that argument, I said in court, hey, listen, that's not what I'm doing. You know that's not what I'm doing. The Galveston evidence is completely relevant for all the reasons I've said and the judges said. 100% absolutely relevant. If I were trying to muddy up your client, I would have tried to get in the allegations of your client allegedly murdering three young girls. I've never even brought it up. I've never tried to get it in. So, yeah, that kind of divides up. So, no, I do not think... Back to your original question, I do not think that Bob Durst is a serial killer with other bodies we don't know about. I don't. Interesting. Why do you think people like that theory so much about him, sort of? It's the same reason that I would never put an actor or an actress on my jury. Never. Why? Because they want the unusual. They want the twist ending. So it's much more interesting that in addition to killing Kathy, Susan Morris, Bob's a serial killer. That's much more interesting. Right. It's the same reason you're asking me for it. It's, it's, it's clickbait. It's clickbait for jurors, you know, when they're... Right. So in the end, people want that because it's interesting. Right. Uh, doesn't make it true. And I'm never going to put on a piece of evidence, whether I think it's helpful or whether it hurts, if I don't believe in it. Now, technically speaking, as a prosecutor, I am not required to decide whether or not a witness is credible. You understand, I'm allowed to present witness A says this. It's up to the jury to determine whether they find that witness credible. So there's nothing unethical about me calling a witness that I personally don't believe, unless there's hard evidence to show that they're being untruthful. My own personal policy for 30 years has been, if I don't believe, trust a piece of evidence, if I don't trust a witness, I don't call them. That's my own personal rule. And so I don't, I don't make arguments I don't believe in. That's why I love being a prosecutor. That's why I love being on this side. You know, it's very hard to be a defense lawyer and to tell your client, hey, listen, don't worry. We're going to get the jury to see what happened. And I also want to tell you, even if we lose, we're going to fight really fair and you can hold your head up high no matter what happens. You think that's what a defendant wants to hear? <laughs> No. <laughs> how many de how many defendants do you think are reassured with don't worry by the end of this trial the jury's going to know what happened? <laughs> probably probably not a lot of them. No. Now now for now now for me, for me that's all I have to do. That's why I love this job. My job is simply to get the jurors to understand 
what happened, why it happened, how it happened, and how the evidence demonstrates it. I'm not playing three card Monty, you know. That's not that, that's not what my job is. I, I have one quick question about being a prosecutor versus being a defense attorney, and then I want to go back into your amazing cross examination of Robert Durst. This defense team. Do you know how much Robert Durst spent for the, his defense uh, in this trial? Well, it's been reported that it was between ten and twelve million dollars in total. Mm -hmm. That that also, I think, involves New Orleans as well. Okay. Oh, the pot, not, the pot, not, the pot, not, and the and the yeah, guns. Okay, correct. Great, great. Yes, that, okay. that was that was a case. That was a case where Bob Durst originally had an offer of sixteen months and ended up pleading to eighty-four months. <laughs> what happened there? Can you say quickly, or he just no. he just waited too long, or no? Okay, so uh, let's no, moving no. on. So they tried to paint themselves. So this twelve million dollar defense team painted themselves a as up against this incredible power of the state. Chesnoff said in his closing, Bob Durst needs all the help he can get. Look how many lawyers they have. He's up against the. I, he didn't use, use these words, did you, but did, the awesome did, power did, of the state. Right. And this did, is my... Did, oh, okay. Cool. Did you find that in any way effective, or did you find it completely offensive? It was... I found it offensive, but I'm not the target audience for, the, for that. <laughs> for that every... <laughs> closing. I, so I've talked to the jurors at length. Every single juror found it offensive. The idea that you're up there, Dick said something, now I believe in Bob, and you know, I'm up here because Bob needs, you know, I believe and I trust him. Yeah, that and that and the 12 million will get you a lot of support. We've come to the end of today's episode with Deputy DA John Lewin. Tune in next time for part two of this interview to discover what Robert Durr said on the stand that shocked the renegade prosecutor. I'll give you a hint. It's something that may have never been disclosed in the history of trials. It's a good one. Thank you for listening. Please help me make more brave, accurate, true crime reporting you won't hear anywhere else and access bonus content at the same time by becoming a patron. The link is in the description of this episode. Until next time, have a great week, everybody. I'm Roberta Glass, and I'm now off the record.